Our next talk is going to be um, Surgical Planning and Adult Deformity Surgery by Dr. Lionel Metz, one of our orthopedic surgeons at UCSF. Thanks very much to Chris and Vidat for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my disclosures really don't have anything uh, critical to this talk. So by way of a 30,000 foot view for case planning, um, I think the most important thing is the chief complaint. Why is the patient coming to you for help? What are their pain generators? Can we identify them? Can we match them to their uh, anatomic lesions on imaging? And then we figure out the levels um, that we need to treat the region of the spine with the deformity, the radiographic parameters, current and our target parameters. We position patient appropriately, get fixation, perform release and decompression, and then our correction. And then critically, you know, PJK is still a un, uh, sort of unresolved issue in adult deformity. So it's something that you should plan into your, um, your approach to adult deformity. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of preoperative causes of pain, the deformity itself um, can be a pain generator. That can be a coronal curvature, rib and pelvis deformity, sagittal malalignment, or coronal decompensation. With adult patients, we also have to think about spinal stenosis, which could be central, lateral recess, or foraminal. Spondylosis can cause both back pain and projected or uh, referred pain, and then sagittal, sagittal malalignment, again, is, um, is another cause of pain. We, this dovetails into our indications for surgery. With deformity, if the, if the deformity is severe, painful, or progressive, or unacceptable to the patient, um, if the patient has unresolved or refractory stenosis, spondylosis or back pain that's refractory to non-operative treatment, or sagittal malalignment that's eroding their quality of life. Dubasay gave us the concept of the cone of economy, and um, generally, think, generally speaking, it's the concept that the head, when the head uh, lays over the feet, there's less uh, expenditure to stand and to ambulate and less um, ensuing pain from activities of daily living. There are various ways to fall out of that cone of economy. These are some more striking examples of, um, of neuropathic and, uh, and neuromuscular deformities that, uh, that um, lead to this fall out of the cone of economy. In terms of the approach to the adult patient, it really is critical to understand their chief complaint. Um, when it's not clear what they're coming in for, or what their most important, um, most important pain generator is, see them again. Dermatomal, sclerotomal, and postural pain have to be distinguished. We have to match the chief complaint to the pathology and the imaging, and then devise a plan to address that pathology with a sustainable solution. And then we have to set expectations. There's very few patients that we can take from 10 out of 10 pain to zero out of 10 pain, and then execute our plan and follow through. This is just to point out the differences in dermatomal, sclerotomal, and postural um, pain generators, which we have to sort of think in all three categories when we're evaluating patients. Our preoperative radiographic evaluation uh, is put in the context of our spinal pelvic parameters. We, it's well worked out now that pelvic incidence really determines the shape of the spine and really drives the, um, this correlation between pelvic incidence, lumbar lordosis, and thoracic kyphosis. And this chain of correlation gives us an idea of what the ideal shape of the spine should be after a reconstruction. It's important to get the whole picture. You know, it's amazing that we, I think up to, what, three years ago, we didn't have access to EOS. And we really couldn't quantify the compensatory mechanisms that patients were recruiting in order to stand up straight. So we just had an incomplete understanding of uh, the severity of these deformities, especially with patients with iatrogenic flatback. In terms of sagittal alignment, optimal, uh, optimal sagittal alignment allows, again, the head to fall over the feet. With suboptimal sagittal alignment or malalignments in the spine, we find that we uh, recruit these compensatory mechanisms to maintain that cone of economy. 
And then with severe deformities, patients fall out of that cone of economy and, and end up with a decompensated malalignment. These are some of the uh, alignment objectives that we use to guide our treatment. SVA, again, is probably um, the most tried and true, but, but a very kind of flawed metric for determining uh, correction. We have pelvic tilt, which correlates well to um, uh, quality of life measures postoperatively, and then our PILL mismatch uh, measures as well. <clears throat> this is, this is a, an example of how SVA can be very misleading. This is a patient who presented to me uh, in May and had a relative, you know, some degree of sagittal malalignment and x-ray just a month later. We can see that she's far more um, positively sagittally aligned. And this was a result of of uh, her stenosis becoming more symptomatic. So it's another thing that we have to think through is, is this patient presenting with a positive SVA because of pseudo, sort of a, um, because of stenosis symptoms and the desire to lean forward to relieve stenosis symptoms. Advanced imaging is important um, in terms of defining the intricacies of an individual patient's anatomy. This is an example of a patient with a conjoined nerve root. So finding this preoperatively on imaging on the MRI rather than intraoperatively was critically important to avoid a nerve injury. This is a patient with severe thoracic or uh, severe Schumann kyphosis with autofusions throughout the apex and severe um, spinal stenosis from ossified yellow ligament. This is MRI. And this is a patient uh, with multiple, multiple congenital anomalies throughout her spine. And just sort of taking a careful inventory and listing in a systematic fashion, the anatomy allows us to approach surgery efficiently and, uh, and execute our plan. So what do we do operatively? We decompress symptomatic or impending nerve root compression. That's something that's critically important when we're thinking about sagittal realignments. So patients can have asymptomatic stenosis or even no uh, stenosis, but when we do induce more lordosis, we can cause nerve compression. We stabilize symptomatically degenerated motion segments with a solid orthodesis, correct deformity to reduce pain and excess energy expenditure, and that gets back to the concept of the cone of economy, and hopefully we operate only on segments needed um, to address those goals and avoid doing more than necessary. I think the best framework or the framework I like to use when thinking through a deformity is, is this a flexible, rigid, or fixed or stuck deformity? There really is probably the most important thing in determining um, how you're going to approach the, uh, the pathology. Flexibility, we can assess on bending films, either standing or supine bending films. And then we can look at sagittal flexibility or sagittal correctability uh, by comparing standing to supine uh, lateral films. We also can look at uh, the opportunistic lateral that we get from the, uh, the CT scalp film. In terms of our tools for correction, we had, Schwab gave us this nice classification of the six grades of um, posterior based osteotomies. And we have a, sort of a variety of approaches to the intervertebral disc anterior. We are lucky to have phenomenal axis surgeons at UCSF. We have the lateral approaches, antisoas approaches, T lift and P lift. And so this is just a, uh, a depiction of which levels we can access through these various approaches. Some people would say you could get up to uh, L23 with an A lift, but generally we think of. Um, an a lift getting us from L3 to S1, antisoas from 1 to 4, a, um, a transoas approach from, one to, uh, from L1 to L5, and then p lift and t lift you can really sort of use throughout the spine um, in the lumbar and thoracic spine. Again, getting back to our flexibility assessment, um, for patients with flexible deformities, the, really the mainstay of treatment are type one and type two osteotomies. We typically don't need to do anything 
uh, in terms of three-column osteotomy or interbody fusion. This is an example of a 35-year-old with idiop adult idiopathic scoliosis, uh, refractory to non-operative management, has a flexible lumbar curve and a flexible, somewhat flexible thoracic curve. Notably, she has uh, no significant facet arthrosis from four to one. So we formulate a plan to uh, correct her scoliosis with just using type one and type two osteotomies and then uniaxial screws to derotate the spine. And so this is, we get a reasonable correction without doing anything um, in the interbody space or um, any advanced osteotomies. Moving on to type B or rigid deformities. So these are the more long-standing adult deformities where the spine is not autofused, but it is stiff. And we have to do something in addition to our facetectomies to get our correction. This is an example of a 52-year-old woman with uh, progressive scoliosis and sagittal imbalance as a PIL mismatch over 50, presenting with back and leg pain. Some flexibility we can see on the supine film and on the bending films, but generally a, a relatively rigid deformity. <clears throat> Advanced imaging demonstrates these uh, vacuum discs, which in my practice, and I think um, sort of in the UCSF experience, this is sort of an invitation for interbody work. So many of us are seeing this as an opportunity to gain correction, gain decompression by using the interbody space. And so, just a, I'll do a quick poll of the audience. Who would address this all posterior? Dr. Tan. Who would do all posterior with a PSO plus a PSO? And who would do something staged with A-list or laterals and then posterior? Yeah, so I think a lot of us sort of see it that way. And that's what we did. So stage one for her was an A-lift L5-S1 and then lateral underbodies from L2 to L5. You can see in the, the image on the right that she's at least partially corrected at that point, but in a good position to gain the rest of our correction from posterior. And this is sort of, you know, what we're able to achieve um, with just inner bodies, no three column osteotomy. And, uh, and she did reasonably well. Then we're moving on to our type C deformities. So these are our fixed and stuck deformities. These are you know, the fun ones that we get to cut three column osteotomies. We see this with either congenital autofusions or congenital anomalies or prior operative treatment. Um, importantly, I think teasing out autofusion, or excuse me, teasing out a fused spine where the disc is open versus where the disc is closed is an important distinction to make. This is a 49 year old woman with multiple prior surgeries to address congenital scoliosis. She had an L3 hemivertebra. Um, she's now fused from T10 down to the pelvis, but has coronal and sagittal decompensation, presenting with back and, um, back and hip pain. With these multiply operated patients, I think that the CT myelogram is critically important to really further um, evaluate the, not just the anatomy, but the um, the dura, the look for things like arachniditis and things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to evaluate just with just an MRI. So this is her CT myelogram, which shows that she does have a solid fusion up to T10. Um, again, just stressing the importance of doing a systematic and detailed review of the anatomy and sort of writing everything down and then devising, devising a surgical plan to address her pathology. And so in her case, um, in order to get her rebalanced, we resected the um, L3 hemivertebra and then did an L4 PSO. Again, she was the one with the uh, conjoined nerve root. And her clinical pictures here. So when is it necessary to do a primary three-column osteotomy? I think this is one of those debates that comes up a lot. Certainly um, wouldn't be an unreasonable approach to this patient. This is a 67-year-old uh, patient, delayed presentation because he was formerly incarcerated. 
represents with a about 70 degree PILL mismatch, back and buttock pain, no stenosis symptoms. So in this case, um, we do see that he is fused posteriorly from L3 down to uh, L5. He does have a vacuum disc at 5.1 and 2.3. Um, and notably, the discs have some partial fusion, but I would consider those to be open discs. And I think that's the distinction that we can make. Some stenosis above his uh, autofusions. So who would, just by a show of hands, who would do posterior only for, for this case? Who would do anterior posterior? Anterior posterior is about five or six. Who would do posterior with a PSO? And who would do posterior anterior posterior, which we all hate doing, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. So that's what, that's what I chose to do for him. Um, just to try to get a more harmonious correction. So first stage for him was actually resecting the autofusions posteriorly from L3 to L5. And then uh, the same day did the A-list, a little um, off center with 5-1, but A-list from 3 to 1. And we can see already we've gotten some, some of our correction from the A-list and the posterior osteotomies. This is just the in terms of um, screw plan. And then we're able to get the rest of the correction just with, uh, with posterior instrumentation up to T10. So he had a L2-3 lateral underbody, L3 to S1 ALIF, and about a 60, 55, 60 degree correction just with multiple inner bodies. So another case where I think initially we think probably need to do a PSO, but um, with open discs, you can utilize the disc space to get a more harmonious correction than you would from a single osteotomy. That's his standing film. On the other hand, we have this 52 year old with progressive scoliosis and sagittal imbalance and a PIL mismatch of about 41 degrees. She, in addition to having posterior autofusions, also has anterior autofusions, uh, autofusions. So this is a case where I think given the, um, the anterior autofusions and the biplanar deformity, it's better to address this with an, with an osteotomy. And so that's what we did for this one. So a lift from four to one, and then a, uh, L three PSO with the apex of her deformity. I think the one key teaching point for PSOs just for the fellows in the room is to think about the continuity of fusion. You, you don't want to do a PSO in the primary setting without being able to follow the fusion from top to bottom. So if you have intercalary motion, eventually they'll break those rods and, uh, and you'll be back for a revision. And then finally, this is a uh, case that I did with my partner in crime, Dr. Tan, a 30 year old with severe Schurman's presented with about 105 degrees of kyphosis. He's the one that we looked at earlier with uh, ossified yellow ligament and um, autofusion throughout the apex, severe stenosis. And so in this case, we, you know, this is a fixed spine. It's not gonna move without a three column osteotomy. And so we addressed it with a, uh, a type six osteotomy. That's our multi-level VCR to both decompress the spinal cord and mobilize the spine. These are some intraoperative pictures showing the, the deformity. We <clears throat> uh, sacrifice roots just on one side. Typically for um, whenever possible, I try to preserve roots on at least one side for deformity. I think it's a little bit of a different situation than um, the osteotomies we, that we do for infection or tumor where there's not as much stress on the spinal cord during the correction, but the more stress on the spinal cord, the more you want to preserve the blood flow. And so in that case, we uh, just sacrifice one side in our correction over a cage. And just to go back here, this is a little hard to make out, but this is the you know, thinking through um, 
our PJK mitigation. We actually did a um, muscle sparing technique at, at the top. This is something I do for most of my adult deformities is try to do uh, transfascial sort of percutaneous fixation at the top two levels to maintain proprioception and uh, muscle stability across the junction from instrumented to non-instrumented spine. And then his uh, post-operative radiographs here. So just to review some of the uh, tips for residents and fellows, take time to plan. I think a good um, rule of thumb is 10 minutes for every hour in surgery that you should spend templating and planning. Um, have kind of a detailed, systematic approach to what you're trying to extract from the imaging so that you're not just glossing your eyes over it, but you're actually taking, um, you know, making useful notes for your, uh, for your preoperative plan. Um, I encourage everybody to, you know, attend courses like this, learn new techniques so you have more tools in your bag to uh, deploy for these cases. And then for complex cases, navigation and an anatomic model is, um, is critically important. And of course, uh, co-surgery is something that we've really kind of demonstrated well at UCSF, but these cases are um, better executed with a co-surgeon. Thank you very much. Thank you.